Um, and just quick, before we start, how many people actually saw the uh, presentation I did at the Drupal Camp Atlanta recently? Alright, so you've heard my joke. <laughs> I forgot it. Just laugh. <laughs> okay, just uh, if you've seen my presentation before, I tend to be very text heavy, and I know that tends to be the, the prime rule when you don't have any kind of PowerPoints and slideshows. Uh, but I tend to put a lot of information into the slides so that you can take them away and use it as a reference afterwards. So um, I have my apology. It is very text heavy. Uh, I've added some fun pictures. Well, I thought they were fun at three in the morning. Uh, that may not be on the big screen. Uh, and yes, the slides will be there. Uh, to start off with uh, performance, it, it can really depend on what type of uh, scope of a website you're working on and what kind of deployment. can depend on which areas of performance you can make and look into. So what I'd like to do is get a rough idea of what kind of websites people work on. How many people are actually working in the cloud and working on very large scale deployments? Come from there. How many people are running their own server? Uh, okay, glad you all put hands up because I'm going to concentrate a lot more on that if possible. How many people are running just hosting at a, a hosting provider? Okay, so that's like not okay. Well, I want to cover um, a number of different things, starting off with a little bit of planning, uh, really just giving you some ideas to think, think, out, uh, think on before you deploy your website, uh, looking at some of the testing tools that are available. And I'm trying to stick specifically with open source uh, for the most part because they're very cost effective uh, and they're very good too. Uh, some of the uh, different deployment options using things like Pressflow and Varnish, uh, looking at the different places where things can go horribly wrong, uh, how to investigate slow areas on the website as well, uh, and then basically how to take each of the different components and try and fine tune them as much as possible. I think one of the first things that uh, comes with any kind of website planning and something that often gets left behind uh, is capacity planning. You really want to try and, uh, for the best part, plan your server architecture or your website, your, your deployment, to use as much of the resources as possible and uh, not really go over. You don't want to get that slashed off effect. You want to plan for it, but you don't necessarily want to run under capacity, otherwise you're paying money for resources not really using. So if you've got a low bounce environment and you're not really getting, you know, even a small percentage of what you're after, you're wasting money. Uh, to determine how successful you are, you really need good metrics. You need to be able to measure how successful you are, especially in terms of things like performance uh, and availability. So you need to come up with a test plan, and I'll show you some ideas on how to do that. It's an iterative process. You don't do it once and then you stop. When you're working with performance, you're continually fine-tuning your program, you're always looking at the results, and you're going back in and you're continuing to it. So you've got this lovely diagram here. And the quote I'd love to come up with a lot is, uh, does anyone know who this was? This quote comes from. Whoever beautiful strategy should occasionally look at the results. Napoleon. <laughs> See, the clue is in the accent. <laughs> uh, I really believe that strongly. Uh, there's so many theories out there, you really have to look at the results and test. This is why I say that I apologize for very text heavy slides. A lot of tools out there are free. Uh, a lot of them are very well, very mature products. Uh, and some of the things that I use quite extensively are things like uh, Jamie is very good, it's one I use quite a lot. Um, we'll look at Sosta. Sosta is not a free service, but is, is very worth looking at, and we'll go over that a little bit more as well. But this is more of a reference. Um, <coughs> JMeter is a big one. As I said, I use that quite a bit for stress testing. It's really good when you have your website up and you want to see if it will survive that massive inrush of traffic. Uh, now, what I want to just cover a little bit about some of the cloud options. Um, Acquia is uh, uh, has a partner which is uh, Sosta, and they have an amazing package out there which is really for doing quite large levels of testing with uh, performance. Uh, using the cloud, they can spin up millions of users to get a website in a, a very short period of time. Uh, and one of the things that's rather nice about it, it's very hard to sell from this graph, they can show you the, the details of that kind of traffic hitting your website in real time, which is very, very telling. 
Uh, it's very good. One of the uh, recent webinars that uh, we had uh, had a marvelous quote, and it was um, there was one time that this one company was on the phone with a Fortune, a CEO for a Fortune 500, and at the same time he was chatting to him, his website was down. Now, as a developer, I don't want to be that guy on the phone with somebody when their website's down. So, if you're looking at a very large scale deployment, I really would recommend having a good site. So it's very good. One of the big things uh, you'll see on a lot of sites is that they say when it comes to Drupal, you really want to try and cache as much as possible. Caching is the key to getting a very fast website. Um, and one thing that's worth looking at is a distribution called Pressflow. Does, has many people ever played with Pressflow? One, two? Okay. Pressflow is basically like a, it's a very optimized copy of Drupal. Uh, the, the developers who actually maintain it have gone through and They've made a lot of uh, core code enhancements to improve it in terms of speed. Uh, PHP tends to run, some of the figures I've seen, between 10 and 15% faster than the standard core Drupal 6. Um, they've also made a lot of queries um, able to be distributed. So if you have a distributed database environment, this is definitely the way to go. The other thing about Pressflow is it works very well with a uh, tool called Varnish. And Varnish is a, uh, basically it's a reverse proxy. Uh, it, it's kind of a smoke and mirrors thing. Uh, when, you hit, when you hit the website, you think you're looking at Drupal, and Drupal loves pulling data out of databases and returning content. But what you're really looking at is a copy from Press uh, from Varnish. It's just a, a page that's been cached. So the result is it kind of takes a little bit of the, work, uh, the workload off the web server and off the database server, and it puts it onto your cache. It's very good. Uh, it's uh, yeah, it's very good. That's why I can say that one. Um, Presto is right. Uh, has put a lot of work back into Drupal 7. Uh, a lot of the code enhancements have made their way back into uh, Drupal 7 core. Okay, this is another one of my cheesy slides. Um, and again, the graphics look very good at three in the morning when I come together, but they look terrible on the big screen. If you find uh, the memories tapped out in your web server and you're trying to figure out what's going on. It's usually Apache. It tends to be one of the rule of thumbs I find when I investigate the problem where a web server runs away. Uh, if memory is maxing out, usually it's the web server that's the culprit. If you have issues with the CPU maxing out, 9 times 10, that's actually PHP. Um, and these are not definitive, but these tend to be the rule of thumbs so that give you a, a good indication of which direction to look at. Amy, could you sort of give an, us an idea of what you would consider a large scale or medium or a small scale deployment, like number of users or number of transactions, just so we can get an idea of yeah. what's your number of modules. What are you talking about? Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll cover modules as well. Um, say more concurrent users, if we're looking at potentially <coughs> a thousand concurrent users, uh, really, really slamming the, the web server. Um, a lot of times, you, when you end up with the thing where you end up with this website where you start to get really heavy performance, starts to bog down. Uh, the trick is really to figure out where to look for the issues. And then usually what I end up doing there is starting to look at the box and see what the box is doing. And then from there, I can get a rough idea of which area to look into. Uh, a lot of times if it's memory orientated, it tends to be a web server. And it tends to be the rule of thumb that Apache is the culprit if it's memory related. Nine times 10 is usually misconfigured mis uh, Apache settings. If people have got the wrong hands client server, the web server is just working really well. Uh, and with PHP, if you find that the CPU is tapping out, uh, then maybe it's worth a go and not code cache. And we'll cover those a little bit more in a minute. But it tends to be what I tend to look at if the CPU is getting maxed out. If the hard drives are going crazy, um, I can find that's a MySQL issue. Uh, MySQL tends to be fairly, it plays fairly well with memory, so a small degree CPU, but the rate is intensive. Uh, so a lot of times, if you end up with issues where you find that your CPU is not really going too hard, but your memory is got you've got plenty of spare memory, but you find that the disks are getting a lot of heavy usage, then that can often be a uh, minus uh, These are the three pain points, and again, there's probably more, but the picture only had three plants on it. So <laughs> I start with the three main ones. These are the main ones I tend to work. Um, I want to look at each one. Uh, the way PHP works is it runs through and it actually creates a series of intermediary opcodes. 
So for anything that you do in PHP, it basically runs through and it's even though it's an interpretive language, it creates these opcodes and it runs it. So they can be cached. And, and you can do that using uh, what's called an opcode cache. Funny enough. And uh, there's a couple available. Uh, the one that's very common is APC. Uh, Memcache uh, can kind of do uh, that and a little bit more. But the, those are the main ones there. Xcache and uh, APC are very standard on a lot of Debian systems. Um, and they're, they, they can make a big difference in terms of performance. So if you are finding your site going very heavy on CPU, start looking at maybe using an opcode cache. We're going a little bit more into uh, opcode caches. Again, because it's a PHP application, because uh, Drupal is PHP, uh, it's always worth actually spending a bit of time profiling your application so you can get an idea of where the memory is going. Uh, it's just the same as any other PHP application. So using tools like Zen Studio or Eclipse or Atom Studio, you can often use those to create profile your application. Uh, the other thing is uh, try to free up services. The way, the way uh, any kind of CGI, CGI applications work, they generate a process, and if, they, if your system is running a lot of processes, even if they're not doing a great deal, they're taking up system resources, and it also takes away the ramp up time to create a new process. So a lot of times, uh, it's worth actually going through your server and clearing out services you're not going to need. Um, a lot of times, I very rarely have FTP on a server. I tend to use SSH as my, as my main access to the server. So take away the process. It's running in the memory, and it's a process space that could be used by PHP. So I always remove those. Telnet, uh, if you don't really do too much on mail, you report that, you can take a lot of those features out. Sometimes cash can go wrong. Uh, and this is a fairly new one. I like the picture. I was going to try and put a little Drupal logo on it, but Drupal tends to play fairly well. It tends to be the things around and we've got I ran into an issue recently where we had APC running on a client and it was actually making things slower than it was actually speeding things up. And one of the things that discovered from doing some research on it was that uh, one of the default settings uh, inside APC can normally be left blank and APC uses system memory to store its cache. <coughs> the first thing a lot of people tend to do is when they configure APC, they set it to the file system. So that what they'll do is as, as pages get written, it actually saves some of the data to the file system. The problem with that is that, uh, well, you know, if the system starts to, to bog down, if you're only mice, you are potentially on the same box, you're going to create discontention and slow down the write. So the wonderful feature of the setting is dev zero. Does anybody know what dev zero is? Because yeah. I only found this out myself a couple of days ago. Does anyone know? Okay. If you use memory, and the system starts to run out of memory on a Linux system, it starts to use the hard drive as swap. Which means that all those lovely things that you thought were running in memory are now coming off a hard drive and could potentially be in a queue behind other data. Uh, slash dev slash zero is memory that's allocated for the kernel and is not allowed to swap to the hard drive. So if you go into APC and actually set your file mask to use dev zero, the memory will never cache the hard drive. There you go, that's really good. And what if you <laughs> kill the kernel memory? No, uh, I thought about that because uh, yeah, you don't want to take you don't want to take stuff away from scale. Um, it does scale. And the thing is APC as a default actually uses dev zero if it's blank and usually on deployment it's blank. Um, most people go in and either set it to memory or they tend to set it to the hard drive. But if you leave it blank, the default value is dev zero. And it's like, well, I found out that, that it's memory that's never cached to the hard drive. It means that you get very good performance out of APC. Can you make that bigger? Sorry? Can you make that zero bigger? Um, I'm not sure actually how, in terms of how it should allocate to the default. I think it's different on each system. Uh, from what I've read, though, it tends to scale up as needed. Uh, but I think you can put a cap on that, which would be a good thing to do, otherwise you'll just overrun your system. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll look into that and I'll do a follow-up. It, it does cap it. The, the kernel has a specific amount of space that each like, slice of kernel memory can use. So it'll never go above that setting. Can, can you adjust that with syscontrol? Though? Yeah, that's how you adjust it. So like APC, you can tell it to use 200 bags, but it can only use one slice, which is 
whatever the kernel says is the most. Well, there you go. Thank you, Eric. Happy. <laughs> but uh, yes, you can use, also use this tool called SysControl, which allows you to adjust that setting. Uh, Andy's big page of weird Apache commands. Um, well, I did this presentation a little while ago, and so I was talking about some of the theory. It's very handy, but every now and then you kind of want to know some of the commands that help you fine tune your install. So one of the things I wanted to do is actually throw a couple of commands up there and break them down so that people can get an idea of what can be fine tuned their Apache. Uh, a lot of the times, people run Apache out of the box, so you'll end up with a lot of modules you really don't need. And the thing is that each of those modules are taking up, um, they're taking up processor um, cycles. So a lot of times, it's a good idea to actually remove them. And the way you can actually test that is using Apache control. And if you run that first command, you'll dump out a list of all the active modules currently in uh, Apache. And you can remove some great ones like mod CGI, mod DAB, mod LDAP if you're not using uh, any kind of LDAP authentication module in Drupal, which requires that. Uh, you can take those out. And they'll actually speak on that. Take them out, uh, how can you tell if you've made any improvement? Well, the next one is a command called AB, which is Apache Benchmark. This comes as part of Apache. Uh, and it's very useful. It, it basically, what you can do, if you put a simple HTML page up, uh, you can tell Apache Benchmark to pull that page down 100 times and to give you stats on how, how often it took to actually generate those requests from the pages. So if you do that before you remove the modules, and then fine tune the module list and run it again, you can figure out if you actually got any kind of benefit out of it. So that's quite handy. Uh, figure out where the memory's going. Uh, VM stat is a very useful command. Uh, VM stat will show you if any of your memories are actually being uh, paid to the swap file. It will actually show you the swap file usage. So if you find that your memory starts to tap out, and you want to find out how much of that is actually using the hard drive, you can use VM stat to do that. Uh, default setting for Apache timeouts is five minutes, which is 300 seconds. Um, that's a lot. So I tend to reduce that down all of my systems. You can also uh, change some of the timeouts on PHP as well. But I can usually go to my Apache config and I've got down to 20 seconds. And you can do that inside your virtual host as well. If you don't have access to your, your config, you can do that. There's a, a lot of arcane knowledge as to uh, how to determine the number of max clients. And there's lots of different theories out there, but they, it tends to be a rule of thumb, whichever approach you take. But what you want to try and do is determine the total RAM inside the system, how much the operating system needs to run comfortably and survive any kind of peak traffic. And then you can then take the uh, remaining memory and divide it by the number of processes your web server is using. Uh, and one of the questions you want to ask is, well, how do I know? how many processes my web server is using. And that's where the PS command can come in. You replace Apache 2 with whatever the <coughs> account name is, or whatever's running in your server, but it will return all the services, and you can get an idea of how many are actually running in your box. Uh, you can also use PMAP as well, and it'll show you the size of each of the processes, and it'll help you determine how much memory you've got in the box, how big a process is, and then hopefully use that in that formula to give you a rough idea of how many max clients you can set. And that's done inside your Apache config. At any point, it's always a good idea to continually test. Uh, if you make a change, and you get it wrong, you can tap it on the server. So always go to the side of caution, but whenever you make a change, come back and look at it and see if you get any, get any benefit out of it. Uh, free minus M, shows you memory. Uh, don't ever, ever get too freaked out when you see a lot of the memory's been used. Uh, Linux systems are very different to, say, a Windows system where they actually allocate memory for processes, but they're not necessarily using it. They just basically allocate it so that if they need it, it's quickly there and they can use it. Uh, if you use a Windows system, if you see all your memory gone, it tends to be a bit of a panic mode. Uh, whereas on Linux, it's, it's often a good thing. And again, good, build, good old VM step. It's a great way of testing to see if your memory is being paged to the hard drive. Uh, some more kind of Apache tips. There's quite a lot on Apache here. I usually find that a lot of times we end up looking at websites. Uh, it tends to, uh, Apache is one of the big culprits, I think, for performance. So I do quite a lot of it. A lot of times these features are also available no matter what your scale of deployment is. If you're either running your own server or to a small degree if you're running on a hosting provider, 
we can use the access log instead. And some of these features can be sent to the HD access log. Uh, one expires is a great one. Um, basically, all you're doing on this one is that um, it's usually default to about two weeks, but it's basically how long it, it caches files. Uh, and you can basically go into your um, HD access file and you can change the defaults on it as well. Uh, one of the things you don't tend to do though is you don't tend to sell the web server to cache any HTML files because Drupal does that. Drupal delivers dynamic content and it has its own caching, so you really want to let it do its job. Uh, but you can change the time in based on file type as well. So if you want to, you can even change it down to say, <coughs> JPEGs and GIFs and PNGs for a longer cache time out than say uh, HTML or content driven by Drupal. Another thing that's quite good with uh, setting your uh, HD access and also your Apache config, uh, try to avoid wildcards. If you end up where you're trying to set the default file, uh, you can just say directory index index, and it basically look for index HTML, index PHP, anything with index in it, it regards the default document. But you're kind of putting your web server through a little bit of a workload to try to determine which file type to use. So a lot of times, the best thing to do is actually be very specific with your setting. Uh, Mod Deflate is a big one. Um, it basically allows you to give you the option to deliver content compressed. Um, there's, a, there's a website I'll show you towards the end that gives you some really good uh, stats on your web page delivery uh, and compressing pages is quite useful. You can also change it down by uh, browser type. Uh, you can be very specific. So if you have issues with a specific browser, predominantly IE can be a bit, a bit funny at that. <coughs> Uh, you can actually break those down and, and actually specify by browser what type of uh, compression. Okay. Uh, web servers. Uh, there's lots of different types of, uh, well, there's three different types of uh, uh, multi processor module or MPM for Apache. And I've seen arguments kind of really across the board as to which one is best uh, in terms of which one to use for your site. Uh, some of the recent tests, I, mean, I saw some really good articles on pre talk uh, It really depends on what type of modules you're running inside Apache, and to a small degree, which modules you run inside Drupal. It tends to be more Apache related. Uh, in terms of performance, they're very comparable now. But you're not limited to Apache. You can use other web servers. Uh, Nginx is a, another web server. <coughs> Uh, it tends to be a little bit faster than Apache. Uh, the only thing that I've heard, I've not actually used it, it's something that uh, I hear a lot of good things about. But one of the things that uh, people do say is a little bit tricky is it's not as easy to configure in terms of things like library variables. So if you want to get clean URLs working, then that's something that's a little bit tricky to do. There seems to be plenty of documentation actually out on the Drupal.org website, plenty of discussion. Uh, and it's definitely something to work with in the You've also got uh, live HTTP, uh, good performance again, and uh, same discussion. Uh, although there has been a lot of um, argument over running Drupal 7 uh, against it. Uh, and again, not through experience, it's really through discussion. But Drupal community is great for figuring out problems, so they seem to be moving quite fast on getting it running on Nginx and live HTTP. And this is not one. You can run it in Windows. Now, from my perspective, standing up here, I can see grimaces and all kinds of things. Um, I, can, I, I actually did a lot of work in Photoshop. Uh, there's quite a lot of occurrences <coughs> with companies who are very much Microsoft-based. And uh, Microsoft has actually done quite a lot of work with Anchor, and they've got a fairly decent uh, system on the out there. I normally wouldn't recommend um, Drupal on a Windows platform, mainly because a lot of the libraries that your modules may use are very dependent on the code which is very native to a Linux system. But it apparently runs fairly well. And Microsoft has a dedicated page up there on how to run it. So that's worth looking into. If you're a Microsoft shop, it's definitely worth looking into. Database. Um, standards, when you, when you create a database from scratch on the whole, it tends to be my ISAM as the database type. Um, one of the things that you can do is you can change some of your table types to I and then ODB. And there's one major difference between the two types. Uh, there's a principle called locking, table locking. The idea is that when you try to write to a database table, you have multiple users, 
you don't potentially want to have the same user overwrite the same record. So what databases tend to do to protect themselves is they lock the database tables down. Uh, with my ISAM, it locks the entire table, and then it allows you to make the change, and then it opens up again for usage again. It's very fast. I mean, it, it's, you're not really going to see a huge wait time in, in pre-execution. But if you have very large database tables, it can add up quite extensively. So one of the things you could look at doing is changing the type to INO NDB. The big advantage of that for, uh, database type is it does row level locking. So it only locks the record being edited. So you find that you get less chances of uh, a query being queued, trying to write to the database, because it's only going to lock the record right out. It's not going to lock the entire table. If you've got a large website with thousands of users, and if you think about your sessions table, the session table can get quite large, especially if you don't print it down on a regular basis. And if you're locking that entire table out every time somebody wants to create a session or a new session, it's going to create some issues. You can actually look inside uh, the variables inside uh, uh, MySQL. <coughs> and if you look for these two settings here, you can determine whether or not I know NDP is actually a good option for your database. Uh, if you have a lot of weighted queries, these are queries that are basically getting stacked up behind each other waiting for that table to unlock. Uh, so if you find that the proportion tends to be a much higher number down here, then it's really worth looking at changing the database type to I know NDP. And it's very easy to change. You just run the simple alter statement. And that's it. It's going to be in the slideshow to take it away. So good candidates. Uh, all the cache tables. Uh, there's a number of cache tables in uh, six. Drupal 6 are worth changing. Watchdog, if you're running it. Uh, sessions, access log. Uh, all of these tables get access on a regular basis. So if you change the file type on the, it changes the database type for those, it can make a huge difference. Uh, you can use a tool called MySQL Report. Uh, it's a kind of a nice little one-liner. Does a basic stats on your on your database, and you can set up a con job to email it to you. It's very handy if you want to run going and checking in for 10 minutes just to get an email back to say your database is about to crash. Uh, it's kind of nice. Uh, the, the development module is also very handy as well. Uh, you can use that for identifying pages which are very expensive query wise. Uh, some of the most uh, fun consultancies I've had is where I've gone in where a client has gone so module happy that we open it up in their database and they've got 143 modules running. And to get to the About Me page, it takes 600 queries. Uh, and then they wonder why the website's slow. So, using the develop module, you can actually get it to audit and show you those queries at the bottom of the page, which is very useful. It's also good to show people how many queries are running and to try and convince them to come back on the time. Uh, caching in Drupal 6. Um, I'm going to cover a little bit on Drupal 7, but the majority is going to cover most of the stuff on 6. There are six tables that come with um, Drupal for caching. Um, those can be great candidates for INO and DB. Uh, because they can get quite large. If you're a developer and you're running your own modules, um, maybe it's a good idea to write your own caching tables as well. Uh, main reason is if you write your own cache tables, you're not competing with the Drupal system every time you want to write something to a cache. Uh, also, most functions have a reset parameter as well. So, if you use a function, the reset parameter usually clears out the cache that uh, the database actually get around to the cache. You've also got uh, three settings you can use for performance on uh, uh, Drupal 6. Uh, the two main ones we'll look at is uh, normal and aggressive. Uh, basically, what they do is uh, Drupal bootstraps a series of steps when it goes from like 0 to 60 when it pulls a page up. When you set it to normal, it will just take it enough queries to deliver the content on the page. Uh, aggressive caching can bypass a lot of those modules too. So you find that aggressive caching is too aggressive. If you have a lot of modules and your site requires them, turning your website to aggressive can really be a problem. There's a third option, which is not set inside Yammer, and that's called the fast part. This is actually done inside the settings PHP. You can actually specify a file path to be used as cache. So instead of having to go to the database, it actually writes it to the hard drive and stuff. Uh, the last one is consolidate JavaScript <coughs> CSS. Um, when you choose that, it smushes them all together. I think that's the technical term. Uh, so if you've got 10 JavaScript, 10 CSS, pushes them in, gives you one. Uh, smushing. 
Uh, some of the tables worth looking at. Uh, if you've got a large number of users, the session tables can get quite large. Uh, depending as well on how, you, how often you clean those down, um, it can get to the point where just logging into the system can take a long time. So it's worth changing the amount of time that that actually gets cleaned out. A lot of that is done as part of the standard garbage collection, which is usually uh, run through when you run the cron. It basically runs through and includes the table data. You can change the time uh, or the life cycle for data in those tables. And a lot of that is done through the same to the HV. Uh, you can change everything from the time that your data expires uh, down to cookie time. You can even change it so that the session gets cleared out when the user logs out of Drupal. Seven. Um, there's, it doesn't look like a huge amount of changes in seven, but there have been. But most of them tend to be under the cover. Uh, you'll notice that when you go in there that you no longer have throttling. Uh, throttling is a feature that's created on six where you can specify the thresholds that if the site starts to get under very heavy workload, you can start to turn modules off. Uh, a good example could be you know, search might get a bit heavy. Uh, that's been removed. And you'll also notice that the normal and aggressive options have been removed from the pages line. A lot of the features that have gone into certain in terms of performance, uh, a lot of work's coming in on the PHP level from the Crestflow. They've actually optimized a lot of the queries, so a lot of the queries behind the scenes are a lot more uh, efficient. So there are some there are some back-end uh, improvements from COVID. Uh, new performance logging option is great for any kind of stats. If we go back to that first slide, when we talked about Fed roles continually trying to uh, check our system, see how it's working, always fine-tuning it, uh, we've now got a much better logging in Drupal server, which is pretty good. Uh, Uncached pages are much more improved. Uh, fewer queries are run on path various lookups on Drupal 7 as well. And uh, I've noticed there's a lot better integration with APC as well. One, one thing I usually end up doing, which is uh, on a really large site, is when you've got a lot of content, is look at maybe an alternative to the built-in Drupal search. Drupal search is fairly good, but when you start to run into thousands of pages, it tends to bog down quite a bit. Uh, if you're doing anything with uh, cron jobs that take half a day to run with it gets what? There's a time limit for the <coughs> cron job, but you find that the system starts to get very bogged down, which has lots of content to try and scan, then maybe it's worth looking at an alternative. And uh, there's a couple of alternatives out there. You can use Google Search Engine, um, which is completely separate. There are a few modules out there which allow you to integrate it. Um, it's very good. I find it can be a little bit uh, problematic to set up, uh, if you, especially if you're trying to log your own search engine. Uh, a very good alternative is Acquia Search. Uh, Acquia Search is uh, it's very tightly integrated with Drupal. Um, they provide modules uh, that basically just allow you to, to modify to a very high degree of your search uh, And the slice is, is there you go, I think it's about a thousand nodes, is it, Harry, for a basic slice? People don't run into that one. I think it's higher. Is it a bit higher? Maybe. It's five or ten. Really? Yeah, yeah Acro Search is really good. Uh, put, we've been putting it on a couple of sites, and it's a very, it's very worth it to uh, The other one to look at is Apache Solar. It's um, an Apache product. It's basically a, a Tomcat type uh, application. It's a, an open search engine. There are modules out there to integrate it, but it's another good one. But I think if you, if you are looking at it, I would recommend looking at um, Acro. Uh, there's a couple of other things we look at. Um, that, that's the core for most of it. It, it really, if you're looking at the, the database environment, the PHP, the web server, they tend to be the main areas I tend to look at from running into issues on the website. But there's a lot more other things we can do which are more related to how we put the website together. Uh, when you're putting a theme together, uh, one of the common themes with trying to make very fast websites is to try and reduce the number of HTTP requests. How many times do we call something back to the web server? So often using uh, a sprite map instead of lots of images can end up with a, quite a heavy boost in performance in terms of putting your themes together. Uh, for those who are not familiar with sprite map, a sprite map is one image which basically has most of the images or parts of the images on your website and you manipulate them through CSS. Uh, the advantage of using a sprite map is that they tend to get cached very early on. Uh, so you end up retrieving one image instead of say 20 or 30 on your theme and it gets cached in the browser, and then subsequent views fall from the browser cache, they don't necessarily put it again from the website. 
Uh, if you use a lot of uh, um, JavaScript frameworks, uh, jQuery is built into Drupal. But if you use others, um, take a look at using something like the Google JS API. Uh, basically, what that does is uh, Google actually hosts and maintains uh, copies of most of the major AJAX frameworks. And you can call all of those directly from your own themes. Uh, the advantage of doing it that way is that um, in the code, you can switch to different versions. So if you want to run jQuery 1.3, or if you want to run something from Prototype, or Scriptaculous, or do something that's a little bit off the wall, you don't have to download and maintain the latest copy. You can manipulate the code and just tell it to go and retrieve it from Google. Uh, the other thing is, because so many sites tend to use this feature, it tends to be cached in the browser again. So a lot of sites you go to are probably using this and you didn't know. So you don't end up with the same kind of issue where it tries to retrieve JavaScript from Say good. Uh, throttling and block crashing. Um, throttling is a, is a very good feature on uh, six, but I, I think it's a bit of a trade-off. Throttling, as I said earlier, as, as the site starts to get very busy, you can actually go in and set uh, blocks to turn off basically the point of the threshold. Uh, the only thing is, you don't really want parts of your website shut down just because you get busy. Uh, it, it's not really a good idea. They've removed the feature from seven. Uh, but it's, uh, it's something to think about if you end up with one or two custom modules that are quite intensive. Uh, as much as I said, don't install many modules. There are a couple of good ones out there for caching. Uh, cache router, boost, the developed module, and auth cache. Now, a lot of people talk about boost. I prefer not to use it as much. Uh, there's a lot of different options and settings in boost. Boost basically will allow you to create um, the same kind of behavior as something like Varnish, where it creates uh, static copies of pages. Uh, the only thing is that um, I find it's much easier using Cache Router. I can actually specify how to use my file system, or use APC, or use mCache. It gives me a little bit more control. I can offload that workload somewhere else. Um, but again, you, you get very degrees on it. It all depends on the site and the number of modules you want to what kind of workload it's at. Uh, if you're delivering a lot of content in terms of um, files, the file structure and clean sites can get pretty big. Uh, what you may want to do is actually look at a content delivery network. They're very good for a uh, very fast, um, fast delivery of assets, especially across large numbers of users. Uh, certain areas of your Drupal site, and they break them up again as the file system. Uh, it's a perfect kind of thing for that, and there, there's plenty out there. Another large page of links. Um, some of the tools that you can use for testing. Uh, we've already talked about some of them. Uh, with Jay Meters, again, from Apache, great for stress testing. Uh, the top one is a very good one. If you're looking at um, trying to get an idea of where to fix your site, a lot of times the web page, web page test.org is a great place to visit. Uh, they'll actually give you a really good stat of all these, all the different techniques you can use for optimizing your theme, optimizing your site. Uh, optimizing how pages are delivered, and you can use that as a checklist to actually work through and try and find your site. Uh, Apache Bench, again, is very good for de determining if you squeeze any extra performance out of Apache. Uh, again, when you're testing that, try and test against the HTML page. If you test against PHP, you start to throw extra variables in the mix. So if you're testing against plain HTML, you're really testing what the web server is doing. Uh, MySQL Report, it's very good if you want to um, Determine if your database is uh, the, the problem. Uh, a lot of times, especially when we to look at uh, queues, uh, queries going to wait in the wait state when they're trying to wait for a token to unlock before they get delivered, uh, that will actually present that information to you. I don't like to try and spend all my day staring at database stats. I wonder if there's so many emails or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now I can go and look at it. Uh, performance articles, there's a lot of really good stuff with uh, Google, uh, both Yahoo and uh, Google's got a great performance team, and they put a lot of their articles up online. Uh, the the Wiseslow uh, Firebug plugin is very good as well. Uh, if you use Chrome, there's a great feature in Chrome as well that will actually allow you to look at all the different elements inside your website and shows you uh, timing on how long each piece can get delivered. Uh, you can often find maybe one JavaScript on a, an external website. It's just dragging your entire website down because the way it's been linked in. So, and that's a great way of identifying this. Uh, if you're an Ubuntu user, Landscape is a very good tool for determining stats to find out uh, long-term uh, 
breakdown of how your memory is doing, how your displace is being used, uh, how much Apache is being put, put under pressure as well. If you don't use Ubuntu, there's another tool called, tool called Moonin, which does the same kind of thing. It gives you very good long-term stats. And it's very good if you want to even out your capacity planning over a period of time. So great books. Um, the art of capacity planning is very, very good. Um, anything by uh, Steve Sanders uh, is a great chat to read about uh, website performance. And he's written a whole slew of books. He started off working for Yahoo on their performance team, and now works for Google. <coughs> Uh, he's written some great stuff on uh, how to optimize, uh, for the majority of the time, how to optimize websites where you have to remain any kind of content under heavy pressure. Uh, so I think that's a stuff like that. Uh, MySQL can be a big bottleneck, so also looking into high performance MySQL. Well. So, that's me at the end of the presentation. Uh, does that want any questions? Um, with parts of Pressflow making it into Drupal 7, is there a Pressflow for Drupal 7, or do we know uh, uh, They're still work. I was reading an article on that this morning, actually, that they are talking about that they are pushing for a Pressflow 7, uh, but it's still very much in development. Uh, a lot of sites, are, a lot of the presentation is really pushed towards Drupal 6 because there are so many sites that are still pushing 6. And a lot of the techniques that we used here are still work for seven because mostly the work we're going to do is using something like Pressflow and Varnish and optimizing the database and the website. So, but yes, there is a Pressflow system. I'm curious how much of a performance hit it is to run uh, PHP in, in uh, CGI as opposed to just running it because running like for mod rails or passenger you have to have CGI. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Uh, th there's two different ways you uh, you can run PHP. Uh, one is the CGI which basically runs it as a separate process or running it through mod PHP. Um, I've, I've seen good stats as far as running it as CGI over PHP but I, I don't really have any stats that defensive so one is better than the other. A lot of people tend to like running it as uh, external because then they can better do Figure out the memory and CPU usage. But I don't really have a good stats on that. Yeah. Do you use a lot for uh, mod fast CGI as well? Mm -hmm. Fast CGI, fast CGI module? Yeah, I, you know, I haven't looked at, I don't know too much on the stats on that as far as performance. Um, and yeah, I, I think there's something, I'll follow up on that and put something up on the website with the slide chat because it's a very good question. How much it does it, supposing I put Google Analytics on my uh, each page of my website, does it affect the performance? Uh, good question. I was asking if uh, Google Analytics can affect performance. Uh, Google Analytics has got a very good way of actually embedding a JavaScript on a page. They use a technique called non-blocking JavaScript. Uh, the nature of how you embed JavaScript on a page, it tends to be sequential. It's like a shopping list. It goes from one item to another. So, and the reason it does it that way is that the JavaScript number one might affect something in the page that another JavaScript would be affected by. So what Google does is they actually use this technique where they write inline JavaScript that tells the browser, here's the link to my external JavaScript. And basically what happens then is the browser goes and does the work. So in English, because that sounded more confusing when I explained it, um, is the JavaScript tells the browser, go and get me this JavaScript, and then it moves on to the next task. So Google Analytics is not bad uh, in terms of script. The problems you get is when you get lots of JavaScripts calling external services. And if you basically get one script after another, you're at the mercy of that proposed service. But if you take the Google approach, where you write inline JavaScript that generates the script tag, that the, the browser will run it and then move on. So it doesn't get hung up waiting for that JavaScript to come back. So the answer is no, it won't care too much. Google got it right for that. I have a performance hit, is it running through PHP? Which one? Like SIP, SIP PHP. Um, and as a, you end up running as whoever owns the PHP file. Uh, again, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I don't really have that much stats in the way of the different ways of running PHP in terms yeah. of performance. Because like, I, I noticed that a lot of hosting sites tend to do that. Yeah, so that uh, the yeah, user's so always dealing with only with his, uh, his own own files rather than having a mixture of I own it versus 
yeah. the uh, Apache server owns it. I would have thought it would have made a huge difference, but then I, I, I don't have any stats on that. But I think that, that's a good question. We want to know really if, if uh, the different ways of running PHP have got different performance values attached to it, whether it's running as one PHP or CGI or if running it with a PHP. Yeah. Was the question for SU, like SUPHP? Yeah. Yeah, I would not recommend that if you're doing Drupal just because of their performance. Do you see a big performance check on that? Yes. Okay. Well, there you go. So I like it with other people. <laughs> Um, I, think it's, I think it's a good point, though. I think I'll, I'll do some research on that, put some stats up, uh, because I think that's, I like numbers. It's always good for me to do some comparison. Do you have a favorite operating system environment, either for a server that you bring up by itself or a cloud server? Yeah, I, I do, actually. I'm a huge Ubuntu fan. Um, I saw it briefly there. I, I like uh, I, mean, I like Debian, I like it uh, but pretty much it's um, I like all of them experience to be honest. I, I started originally using SUSE uh, before they became developed when they were uh, originally a German company. They were very good, and um, but any any version of Linux is good. But my preference is I tend to like Ubuntu. I can spin up an Ubuntu box really quickly, and um, using app get I think it's, like, it's really easy to install. There was, a, there was a big, big MongoDB conference in Atlanta today in Atlanta. Do you have any opinion about other databases beyond um, Well, one thing I like about, one of the things I do like about MySQL is it's fairly lean compared to some other database systems out there. Um, it, it's been, always been that trade-off. When they first came out with MySQL, we ended up with this really lean, fast environment. But we did it at the sacrifice of things like store procedures, uh, triggers, um, you know, even things like uh, subselects, which were quite common in other database systems. But it made some of our websites really quite fast compared to some of the alternatives. Um, Postgres is a good database environment, but I, I tend to get better performance in the kind of MySQL. But there are some really good ones out there. There, there, there is definitely some improvement. With Drupal 7, you can actually write your own uh, database connection link, so theoretically you can run on any database environment. Again, I don't really play that too much, so I'm a nice girl. But database is dead, so I like that. Yeah, um, you said a little bit about that. Uh, in your opinion, what, uh, which one of the popular modules we should be like, careful of using if you you know, if you side my go uh, and have your traffic? I mean, the modules that you have to be careful to use. Uh, you know, it, it really it's really hard to tell. There's so many. Um, uh, the question was, which modules would you really want to avoid if you could write a high volume website? Um, it, it's amazing how even some of the very commonly used modules every now and then will come up with either a security uh, issue, or you could end up with just some badly written um, SQL in the back end, or even where it creates the database table where it doesn't index the table, which can add quite a huge performance here. Um, I tend to be a, a little bit kind of uh, finicky about the modules I install. I try to keep them to the point where I get the functionality I'm after, but I try to also, I really do look through the source code and see how they put things together. A lot of times when you have to look at sites, we may end up doing a lot of uh, database cleanup, because even doing things like adding indexes to queries. Um, but it's amazing how many how many modules do you know, distinct statements on the SQL and just drag the website down. So there's no definitive list, unfortunately, you just have to be, just try them and test. Okay. Uh, do you have a preference uh, towards, uh, say, if you're setting up a site that, uh, or working on a site that uses views heavily, um, versus uh, moving all that to custom module code? Uh, views are really good. Uh, views are handy. <laughs> yeah. um, if, if in terms of uh, database queries, and <coughs> how you do it? well, it's part of a preference on that. I, I'm, I tend to like doing a lot of things native in the database. Um, it, there's a lot. There's a lot of performance gains I tend to get if I write things like a store procedure uh, and then call it from my SQL. So I find I, I can actually put a lot of the workload back in the database. And a lot of times the environment may be split between the web server and the database server. So the web server might get hammered when the website gets a lot of traffic in, but the database server could be ticking over. So sometimes I'll shift some more logic over to the database. But there's no views are here to stay. I mean, they're, they're really good. <laughs> So um, I tend to find that with views, just again, as I put views in and, and play with them, I do tend to test as I go to see if I've got something that really slow down. 
It does give you the sequel, so you can take it if you need to do some explaining. Yeah, but I've seen some terrible sequel uh, put together, which got really dragged us up there. Uh, and it, it's um, it, it, using the development module is very handy because you can see the crews that go on behind the scene. Uh, crew caching inside MySQL is very handy. If you find that the same crew gets run again and again, you can actually go into the MySQL settings and actually set a crew cache. Uh, and the result is that a lot of those repetitive queries will get cached and just get different caches. But it's really worth looking at the development module and seeing what runs behind the scenes on the website. Because when you look at a page that takes six to eight hundred queries to deliver on the About Me page, then you know, there's a problem. <laughs> Someone else? Okay, I think I've put you all to sleep now. That's <laughs> 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 my attention, I apologize. <laughs> Look back in and we a performance problem with the database. You can go in and put in and index it. So sometimes uh, bad written modules, don't, they, they'll often do queries against a the table, they don't index it. Um, and you end up to just take just queries that just take much longer than they should do. Uh, the other one that's a nasty shock is when they use distinct statements as well. They can uh, slow it up pretty now. Uh, when you're thinking, can you give some tips about dealing with images? For instance, like JPEGs versus PNGs, or it's, the size of the image, or anything like that? I, I, tend to, I tend to like taking that approach using a swipe map, um, and, it, and it's basically why I'm using one image. I tend to go for the PNG side of things, um, but it all depends on how heavy support you're going to do for all versions of my uh, Internet Explorer. I've had problems before. With IE6, I had to a smaller to be set. Even though they said it was a bit, it's still a bit buggy in certain as well. The transparencies. So, on IE, are you saying that with a PNG that Internet Explorer you might can, not well, recognize it? Or that no, it on all the versions, on, on transparencies, it can get a bit busy uh, or it can even blank it out completely. Uh, there is a uh, PNG fix you can do for IE6. It depends if you want to go back out of file. It depends on the client's needs. I prefer to say uh, IE6 just needs to die and go away. <laughs> because even, even Google doesn't support it now as far as things like YouTube. So it's an old browser, but it will depend on the client. There are some clients who need that. So if you do have a client that needs IE6 support, then probably look at doing a, 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 a GIF into a, a PNG. PNG is very good. You want to do those nice uh, Ajax transparent overlays. You know, you go to Netflix and you roll over the video and you get that nice little pop-up. Uh, you can get those nice smooth drop shadows using a PNG. But on IE, if you don't have the, the, uh, the PNG fixed JavaScript, or, in other words, patching it, you get a very bitty drop shadow. So I noticed that my PNGs are saving much larger, much, much larger than JPEGs. They, they can, they can contain a lot of information, uh, but it, it, again, it can depend on the image. I started off in the days when we used to try and optimize the two, uh, you know, 256 color palette, which in real terms was actually 214 colors in the early days. So unfortunately, I came from that background. So I tend to use uh, a GIF as a fallback for a small size. Um, but even using a progressive JPEG, you can see the images down there, a huge. <coughs> Just using the safe web feature. How many people use the safe web feature in Photoshop? How about how many people use the game? Uh, <laughs> there's an option for that to save the web as well. And it'll optimize it down as much as it can. So there are some very good tools that are optimized. If you're talking about photos, PNG is probably not, uh, JPEG is going to be the best thing to use. I mean, if you're talking about um, line drawings or simple drawings, then PNG is probably better. Or GIF, but yeah, a, a, a photo, a real thing that you take from your camera, a PNG is not going to do it. If you do a progressive JPEG, you can really get those things down to quite a small, small supply size and still not lose too much of the image. So, in other words, if you want to have pretty much like one photo for each thing and then just size it differently on all your different web pages, I, yeah, I'll set photos up on the JPG. I tend to use the PNG and the sprite map for the actual thing, for just the parts of the thing itself. I tend to, tend to go that route. Okay, but make everything else a JPEG. Well, photographs are very good for JPEGs. Okay. 